Story time now. This is a story that at first blush might appear to be about the fear of death. But if you ask me, it's about something else, and I'll let you figure that out. This is Dave Buys a Coffin. Billy London called Dave at the Vinyl Cafe at lunchtime. Any other Monday, Dave might have missed his call, but not this Monday. This was a Monday in the middle of February, middle of February, and it had been snowing all day. No one had been in the store for a couple of hours because no one was out. And who could blame them? Dave wasn't about to go out. So when Billy phoned, Dave was sitting in the comfy red chair by the cash, his feet propped on a milk crate, a cup of soup balanced on the arm of the chair. Dave was multitasking. <laughs> listening to a new vinyl album, a tribute to Gordon Lightfoot and Neil Young, recorded by a couple of Canadian bands, The Unintended on one side and The Constantines on the other. And while he's listening to the album, he was reading Under the Radar, a music magazine from L.A. When the phone rang, he scooped it up and he said, just a minute. Flipped up the arm on the turntable and he picked up the phone again. Billy, he said, long time, what's up? Billy got right to the point. Billy said, Aunt Ginger died on the weekend. You're the only guy I could think of phoning. I thought you'd want to know. Dave said, huh. <laughs> Billy said, yeah. <laughs> and then neither of them said anything. Dave broke the silence. Dave said, did she make it? She must have made it. Aunt Ginger wasn't Billy's real aunt. She was a family friend of some sort. She had a house in Rosedale and lived there alone. And when Billy slipped into Canada in 1968, dressed like a priest, she invited Billy to stay with her. Billy moved in and he stayed for the better part of seven years, or kept his stuff there anyway. Billy played sax, and Billy was on the road all the time. That didn't bother Aunt Ginger one bit. She was a piece of business. A Tough as nails, determined to live to be a hundred. Missed by three and a half months. Ninety-nine and three quarters, said Dave. It would have killed her to know that. <laughs> How'd she die? Skiing accident, said Billy. <laughs> Skiing, said Dave. Well, snowboarding, technically, said Billy. <laughs> If you're going to be technical. They sat together at the funeral, an altogether extraordinary affair. It was organized by Aunt Ginger's only living relative, her older sister, Muriel. <laughs> Muriel sat in a wheelchair at the front of the chapel as stiff as a plank. The two sisters hadn't spoken, must have been 20 years. It was Muriel who chose the reading, Dr. Phil. Muriel, who chose the decorations, balloons. And Muriel, who chose the music. Muriel, who knew nothing whatsoever about music, didn't know what to say when the funeral director asked her what they should play. So she asked what most people did. The funeral director said that most people chose a classical piece. Muriel named the only classical piece she knew, The Flight of the Bumblebee. <laughs> When the music began, everybody in the congregation looked horrified. <laughs> Except Billy and Dave. <laughs> Not bad, actually, <laughs> whispered Dave to Billy as the piece picked up speed. <laughs> Perfect, actually, said Billy, nodding, in so many ways. The funeral was so awkward and wonderfully inappropriate that Dave couldn't stop talking about it for days. I want Zeppelin at my funeral, said Brian. <laughs> Brian's a philosophy calculus major who works part-time at the Vinyl Cafe. Stairway to heaven, said Dave. It's eight minutes long and totally obvious. Exactly, said Brian. And when they're carrying my coffin out of the church, I'm going to have Ozzy. I'm going to have Ozzy doing, Mama, I'm coming home. <laughs> what about you? Never thought of it, said Dave. I don't know. Uh, uh, Don McLean, American Pie. The day the music died, said Brian. Talk about obvious, I hate that song. 
Right, said Dave. I can't believe I never thought of this before. Dave was pulling on a sweatshirt. He was heading to Woodsworth's Books, barely a block away. He didn't need a coat. How about Cat Stevens, called Brian. Cat Stevens, oh, very young. Cat Stevens, said Dave. Dave had his hand on the door handle. I I'd rather die than have Cat Stevens at my funeral. I'll be back in a minute. Hi, said Dave as he wandered into Dorothy's bookstore. Dorothy had her chestnut hair pulled back in a loose braid. She was reading Gore Vidal. Hi, said Dorothy, putting the book down, smiling. Dave picked up a leather bookmark from a box on the counter and he started fiddling with it. Listen, he said, if I died tomorrow and you were planning my funeral, what music would you choose for my funeral? Dorothy said, oh no. What is it this time? No, no, said Dave, I, I'm fine, I'm fine. This is hypothetical. Hypothetically fine or hypothetically dying, said Dorothy. <laughs> Come on, said Dave, I'm serious. Cat Stevens, said Dorothy. <laughs> Brian phoned you, said Dave. You've been talking to Brian. Two minutes later, Dave walked into his friend Kenny Wong's cafe, Wong's Scottish Meat Pies. Kenny was sitting at his cluttered desk halfway along the restaurant at the end of the counter. He looked up when Dave came in. I'm working on my list already, he said. They phoned you, said Dave, dropping onto the last counter's stool and spinning around. Yeah, both of them, said Kenny. Here's what I've got so far. He leaned over his desk and pushed a piece of paper across the countertop. Enya, said Dave. <laughs> What about Cat Stevens, said Kenny. <laughs> but Dave was already at the door, his stool spinning at the counter. Morley was standing in front of the stove, working on a big pot of chili. It's for the wake, she said when Dave walked in the back door. <laughs> I have it all worked out. We're going to play dead teen songs. Leader of the pack. Last kiss. Tell Laura I love her. Unless, of course, you die in a snowstorm looking for a lost horse, then we'll play the one by Michael Murphy. Wildfire, said Dave. Who called? Everyone, said Morley. Later that night, as they were lying in bed, Dave dropped his book on the floor, pushed himself up on an elbow and said, can I ask you something? Seriously. Morley was reading Real Simple Magazine. She rested the magazine on her chest. Dave said, if you died, what am I supposed to do anyway? Do you want to be buried or what? Morley said, cremated. After that, I don't care. You can put me out with a recycling. <laughs> Flush me down the toilet. I'm serious, said Dave. Morley turned her head and looked right at him. Me too, she said. She picked up her magazine. I love this magazine, she said. End of conversation. He went to Kenny's for lunch. He sat at the counter, his usual stool, at the end by Kenny's desk. If I die, said Dave, chasing a snow pea around his plate with his chopsticks. When you die, said Kenny. <laughs> what, whatever, said Dave. If I die, when I die, what's the difference? Acceptance, said Kenny. <laughs> Dave was in a state, no doubt about it, and the state was intensifying. On the weekend, he even talked to Mary Turlington. Or more to the point, Mary talked to him. They met in the grocery store by the yogurts. Lactose-free 2%, said Mary, without even saying hello. Thanks, said Dave, squinting at the tub she handed him. That was the one. Mary always made him feel like a child. How could she possibly know more about his family's fridge than he did? Mary had moved on. I made our arrangements years ago, she said. <laughs> Morley must have told her about Aunt Ginger's funeral. Dave was looking for more of the lactose-free yogurt. Mary said, over there. Then she said, you know the three most important things about burial? Dave stared at her blankly. Mary said, location, location, <laughs> location.
And so Dave bought a coffin. It's not altogether a bad decision. It was neither the most expensive nor the cheapest coffin. Pine, but red pine. Coffin that seemed to fit his station in the world. Dave began working on his eulogy the next day <laughs> at home at lunch. He got a pad of lined paper out and he worked on it at the kitchen table. He wrote his name at the top of the page, centered. And then he skipped a line and he wrote, he is. And he stared at the words and then he crumpled the paper and he threw it at the garbage, missed. He was one of the most, Dave's pen hovered over the page, one of the most, he crumpled that page and bounced it off the rim of the garbage. He started again. Born in the village of Big Narrows, son of Charlie and Margaret, and one of the most, one of the most <laughs> forgiving, generous, remarkable, humble, humble. <laughs> he was just finishing up the first page when the doorbell rang. Two guys in blue overalls were standing on the stoop. They looked like roofers. The bigger guy did the talking. We got your coffin, said the bigger guy. <laughs> there had been some misunderstanding. There's been a misunderstanding, said Dave. Where do you want your coffin, said the big guy. It had not occurred to Dave that he would be taking delivery of the coffin. Who did you think was going to get it, said the big guy. Dave had them put the coffin in the garage. He covered it with a couple of blankets. Thank God no one was home. In his rush, he left the eulogy on the kitchen table. By the time he remembered the eulogy, he was back at work and Stephanie, home for study week, was reading it in disbelief. Who wrote this crud, she said at supper waving the eulogy in the air. They obviously never met you. <laughs> Give me that, said Dave. He managed to get the coffin to the record store the next day before anyone saw it. There's a room over the store where he keeps stuff. Souvenirs mostly, pieces of paper from the days when he worked in the rock and roll business handwritten set lists, notes, letters, snapshots, some stage clothes, all manner of stuff. An amazing collection of memorabilia, assembled partly for sentimental reasons, but mostly because he can't bear to throw anything out. It never occurred to him while he was squirreling the stuff away that it would be valuable one day. It's how he supports himself, trading and selling pieces when he needs serious money or if someone seriously wants something. He figured he could keep the coffin upstairs with his stuff until he figured out what to do with it. But you try getting a coffin up a flight of stairs by yourself. <laughs> a and you tell me who you would call to help you do that sort of thing. <laughs> so Dave humped his coffin to the back of his store and he covered it with a blanket and he put some crates of records on top of it. And then one afternoon in March, on a rainy afternoon in March, in the middle of a week of rainy afternoons, a week when no one had been in the store for what seemed like forever, Dave found himself looking at the coffin under the blanket and wondering what it would be like to be inside it. <laughs> Not many people wonder about things like that. Fewer have the opportunity to find out. <laughs> Once the thought entered Dave's mind, he couldn't get rid of it. Like I said, the store had been empty all week. He had way too much time on his hands. He removed the milk crates of records and he piled them on the floor. He ran his hand over the shiny coffin. It was actually a beautiful piece of craftsmanship. Pine box, to be sure but a pine box with a luster of ebony. He was just about to climb in, just for a second, just to see. But then it occurred to him that it would hardly be an accurate experience lying there in his comfy sweater and cords. Surely, when he was laid out, it would be a more formal experience. He ran upstairs. 
There was a jacket up there that had once belonged to Eric Clapton. There was, in fact, a whole rack of clothing up there. A shirt Frank Sinatra Jr. had left behind in a dressing room in the Poconos. A tie that had once belonged to Paul Anka. Dave slipped off his T-shirt and put on the shirt, the tie, and Eric's jacket. And that's when he spotted Alice Cooper's makeup kit. <laughs> A job worth doing, as Charlie used to say, is worth doing properly. Dave powdered his face. He looked in the mirror. He looked great. Which is to say, he looked dead. He went downstairs. He ran back upstairs, grabbed some candles, and ran back downstairs. He lifted the lid of the coffin and propped it up, checking the hinge to make sure it wouldn't slam shut. He lit the candles. He dimmed the lights. He put on some music. Etta James, at last. <laughs> he crawled into the box, tumbled into it, actually, bum first. There was not as much room in there as you might think. He had to squirm around awkwardly to arrange himself. In fact, it was pretty cramped. But the silk lining was smooth and soft, and there was a nice layer of padding between him and the bottom of the casket. Hey, thought Dave, not bad. Quite comfortable, actually. Peaceful. Dave folded his arms over his chest. He closed his eyes. He didn't actually fall asleep, but he wasn't wide awake either. He was somewhere in that foggy world between asleep and awake, lying in the coffin with the candles flickering at each of the corners, lying there trying to get in touch with eternity when the front door opened and someone walked in the record store. Dave thought he had locked the door. Dave was sure he had locked the door. Hello, said whoever it was. Apparently not. Dave didn't move a muscle. Hello, called the voice again. The voice sounded familiar. David called the voice. David, are you here? Mary Turlington. <laughs> Mary Turlington had never been in Dave's record store. Uptight and sanctimonious, Mary Turlington wasn't interested in buying or even looking at anything that was used. Mary was suspicious of anyone who bought used goods. Mary preferred reproductions to antiques. The moment she stepped through the door at the Vinyl Cafe, Mary knew her doubts were justified. It smelled funny in there, like incense, or worse. There was suspicious music playing, the type of music that people play when they're up to no good. And it was dark. The place was giving Mary the creeps. Dave, she said, where was he anyway? And what did he do in this dusty, dark shop all day by himself? David, are you here? He must be at the back, she thought. <laughs> Mary moved toward the back of the shop with hesitation. What could he be doing back there that he couldn't do in the open? He could be doing any number of weird and perverted things back there. She caught sight of the candles, and against her better judgment, she walked toward the light. <laughs> That's when she spotted the coffin with the mannequin in it. Just the sort of childish display she would expect of Dave. She is getting closer now, and Dave is thinking, blessed mother of Jesus. <laughs> he can hear her footsteps getting closer and closer, and then he can hear her stop abruptly. Blessed mother of Jesus, said Mary. It wasn't a mannequin in the coffin, it was a body. Oh, my God, thought Dave. Oh, my God, said Mary. Every nerve ending in Mary's brain told her to get out of there and get out of there fast. But she couldn't help herself. She was drawn toward the casket. Don't move, thought Dave. Don't move a muscle. But he couldn't help himself. Dave opened one eye. <laughs> it 
It was the eye Mary was staring at. <laughs> and then the body rose out of the casket. <laughs> like a vampire in a horror movie. And the body said, hello, Mary. <laughs> and then the body took a step towards her. This is how it ends, thought Mary. Vampires? <laughs> then she hit the ground. <laughs> the letter from Stephanie arrived the following week. Dear Dad, Dave got it at lunchtime. He showed it to Morley after supper. Did you tell her to write this, said Dave? No, said Morley, I didn't. Dear Dad, Mom told me you've been worried about dying. She told me that's why you were writing your eulogy. I want to apologize for making fun of you. I'm sorry I laughed at you. I'm sorry I made fun of it. When Paula's dad died, she had to talk at his funeral. I started wondering what I would say if I had to talk at yours. I decided I would tell people about the eye patch. Do you remember all that? I think I was about six. I don't even remember why I had to wear that stupid patch. All I remember was that Dr. Milne said I had to wear an eye patch and that I refused. Nothing was going to make me wear that eye patch. I cried all the way home from the doctor's office. When we got into the house, you sat me down at the kitchen table. You pulled out two eye patches and you put the first one on over your own eye. You said we would have a deal. You said that I would wear my eye patch until Dr. Milne told me I could take it off and you would wear yours until I told you to take it off. I said, but people are going to look at you funny. And you said, well, if they do, I guess I can talk to you about it. You might know how that feels. Do you remember how we decorated them? I think you drew flowers on mine. I don't remember. But I remember I drew a huge gross red eye on yours. <laughs> and you wore it for a whole week before I let you take it off. You wore it to work and when you took the car to the garage and out to dinner at the Turlingtons. <laughs> I can't believe I made you do that. If I had to talk at your funeral, I'd tell people a story about the eye patch and then I'd tell them that that's the kind of dad you were that you'd do anything for me and Sam, even if it made you look silly. I love you, Daddy. I am sorry, Steph. P.S. I don't want you to die. If you die, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Dave took Stephanie's letter to the store. He keeps it in the drawer by the cash. He read it the other day at lunch. Sometimes when he reads it, it makes him happy. Sometimes it makes him cry. Mary hasn't been back to the store, <laughs> though she has been over to dinner, and all in all, it was a successful evening. Dave still has the coffin. It's still in the back of the record store. There's a whole display of 45s in it, teenage death songs. Thank you very much.